where life was dark and life was painful. And through a resilient mindset and a relentless willingness to work, help me persevere through the adversity. And, and I think that is, is what helped me get over the line, right? I was willing to do whatever it takes and I wouldn't take no for an answer. And sometimes you've got to admit it to yourself that even though the obstacles are big, make sure that you do whatever you can over and over and over again to persevere and no for an answer is not acceptable. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 130, The Surge Pay Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pithlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we head down to the Sunshine State, take a walk on the beach with a former teammate of mine, my second season with the Florida Panthers, and begin this conversation if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to sweethockeycoach.com, that's sweethockeycoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome to another captivating episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. Today, we are honored to have a true hockey icon in our midst, Serge Payi. Serge's journey through the world of hockey is not only defined by his exceptional talent on the ice, but also by his remarkable resilience in the face of adversity. Hailing from the hockey heartland of Ontario, Canada, Serge's passion for the game ignited at a young age, propelling him toward a career filled with triumphs and challenges alike. But Serge's story extends far beyond the rink. Throughout his hockey career, he battled through serious health issues that tested his resolve and courage. Yet, true to his resilient spirit, Serge persevered, refusing to let anything deter him from pursuing his dreams. In addition to his exploits on the ice, Serge Payi is the driving force behind the Serge Payi Foundation, a beacon of hope and support for individuals facing similar health challenges. Through the foundation, Serge endeavors to make a positive impact on the lives of those in need, providing assistance and opportunities to overcome obstacles and fulfill their potential. Today, we have the privilege of delving into the extraordinary journey of Serge Payi, exploring the highs, the lows, and the invaluable lessons learned along the way. Join us as we celebrate the indomitable spirit of this hockey role model and the profound impact he continues to make on the game today. Without further ado, let's welcome the inspiring Serge Payi to the show. Sergi, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Lance, so nice to reconnect. Our lives have taken us through the game together, and what a joy it was to play with you And today. Just an honor to to be a part and take some time to, to exchange and communicate. So I really appreciate you having me on. Well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's crazy because it's, it's been over two decades, I believe, <laughs> since our paths have crossed and uh, a lot has happened in between there. But when I think back to, to that year that we spent together in the early 2000s down with the Florida Panthers, uh, I, I just remember Anytime I was around you, no matter what was going on, I always felt a little better after we were done talking. So you just have such a great energy and everyone's going to uh, see that as the, the interview per, uh, progresses here. So I really appreciate you being here and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your journey because in researching for this, there was something that I had no idea you had to go through and we'll get to that down the road. But 
how I like to start the show where I'm interviewing someone is I'd like you to rewind the tape, my friend, and let's take a moment, look in the rear view mirror and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports? Basically, tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up Serge Pipe. Yeah, I appreciate that, Lance. Feelings are mutual on all fronts. Um, the short of it, I grew up in Canada in a small community called Rockland, a town at the time of 6,000 uh, people. It's now grown to a population of probably about 25,000. What part uh, of Canada? This is a small town by the name of Rockland, east of Ottawa, our nation's oh, okay. capital in Canada, um, 30 kilometers east in the direction of Montreal, although on the border, Quebec province and Ontario province border. Uh, French community, I grew up in a French home. Mom and dad spoke French at the house. Uh, older brother uh, by three years, a younger sister by one year. Uh, really, really close siblings. Mom and dad were extremely supportive. Uh, they grew up in an environment where there's a ton of love, great expression, uh, great communication. Uh, Mom and dad were very supportive in uh, making sure that we were living a, a, a good life um, through that love that was shared through the family. Um, Mom had a flower shop. She worked uh, endlessly, put in a tremendous amount of time and effort into making sure that our, our home was filled with uh, joy, love, laughter. Um, our uh, family dinners were mostly joined with uh, the rush of uh, being accommodating to extracurricular activities, whether it was an outdoor rink skate or uh, dad rushing back home from work. My father worked for the Canadian government under the uh, umbrella of uh, computer programming. Um, he would drive into the city every, every day and come back home and pick me up. And by the age of nine, when I started playing travel hockey, uh, my father would then pick me up and drive back into the city for hockey practice. Um, considering what's we came first, from a smaller community. What's your first memory? Just because uh, your first memory, you talked about your the rink. Did your parents, your dad, put a rink in the backyard, or that's just a neighborhood rink? And what's your first memory? Was your your older brother? Uh, was he a hockey player? Is that how you kind of got into it? Yeah. So dad was, uh, was a hockey player himself and he wanted to make sure that we were exposed to the game at a young age. Um, both mom and dad would, would take us to the outdoor rink at an early age. I remember the age of two and three, if I collect properly with pictures and stories, uh, the outdoor rink was across the street. It was an outdoor pond. Um, you know, where community children would just come out and skate. Uh, we only had one outdoor, uh, facility at the time over the years that community's driven to, to build additional ones in the winter time only. We did have a town arena, uh, but that ice time was quite limited to minor hockey development. But as we grew up, uh, from the ages of two to four, it was more learned to skate. And then the ages of four to, to eight it was you know learned learned to play uh, minor hockey with the Rockland Nats and then by the time I reached the age of nine I remember my father sitting me down on a on a living room sofa and asking you know oh, what do you think about joining the team travel in, in in the city of Ottawa and I was quite ecstatic he felt that that time was was the appropriate time to, to put me in travel hockey uh, perhaps play with more competitive players um you know, structured organization and whatnot. And, um, I think it was the right decision. I was actually a, a pretty good skater from, from an early age. And I think from, from that front, my, my mobility, um, enhanced my confidence and over time confidence built, uh, over the years and developed further skills. But, um, from the ages of nine through 15, I played uh, with the Cumberland Barons until I was drafted to the Ontario Hockey League in 95. And then at that point, I moved away from home in Kitchener. My brother was a player. Uh, he also played locally with the Rockland Nats. He was actually quite skilled. Dan was a right shot, right winger, right center. I was a left shot, left centerman, left winger. 
And Dan, unfortunately, in an era where, you know, size mattered, Dan was quite uh, smaller. He was, I think at the time, one of the smallest players on, on his team, but one of the quickest and, and smartest and most skilled. Uh, but ultimately, in, in an era where size mattered, Dan uh, ended up playing local junior hockey, went to university, got a degree in engineering and, and focused on his academics, where for me, I moved away from home at the age of, of 15 to play with the Kitchener Rangers and moved on to, to sign a pro contract in 97 with the Panthers. So younger sister played ringette. She had a successful career on that front and probably so now raising two beautiful girls in, in the game as well. So um, what uh, when when the moment in time, you know, when your dad said, you know, you want to do travel hockey in Ottawa. Um, and that was at eight or nine. But when when was the moment that happened where you're like, OK, I got I got some mojo here. I want to see how far I can take this. Yeah, that's a that's a loaded question, Lance. Um, I don't think it's one definitive moment in time. I, I think it's a it's an evolution in the time. Uh, but I do remember um feeling really good on the ice uh hockey for me was a little bit of an escape i felt going to school was was fun um because you could meet and gather with friends growing up in a small community the benefits of that is people you go to school with tend to be the children you play on the streets with um so those relationships last today which is fantastic um the moment in time uh, dad was a great coach. He, he, he was a part of uh, my development as a parent, as a father, but also as a coach, uh, different times in, in, in my upbringing, he was either an assistant coach, a volunteer coach or head coach, which was great. He played himself. And probably one of the reasons he didn't succeed was probably more related to finances. And he had to help the family earn an income to provide, uh, other than that, he was a, a great mentor, a great father. Uh, a demanding father as well, right? He expected nothing but excellence and uh, he expected us to put in a lot of work and energy and, and, and becoming more than just hockey players, right? It was about developing developing leadership skills to become good human beings outside of the sport. So if there's one thing that I retain a whole lot from my upbringing is making sure that I now, you know, inspire the young youth into doing the very same. Hockey's a phenomenal game. It's so much more than the game, though, right? Uh, to come back to your question, to be specific, uh, I do remember sitting on the sofa when Dad asked. I also felt confident in that decision, right? And he let he let me make that decision, uh, but I do remember feeling pretty good about it and thinking this was the right time for me to play competitive travel hockey um, in Ottawa. We had, you know, two really good travel teams. One was the eastern side of the of the city, Ottawa, and one was the Ottawa Valley on the western side. And then every other city in between, including Gatineau and Hall on the Quebec side, uh, you know, trailing between the third seed and, you know, the eighth seed. But our teams were, were pretty good. And I was amongst, you know, uh, one of those players that, that, that could play with an age group a year above, right? So physically I could manage it, I could handle it. And, you know, I, I started playing travel hockey at that particular time with kids that were, were one year older. So I think a part of that was was due to my my mobility and physically I was, I was not big, but I was strong. And, and I think with those two intangibles in, in my skill set, I think I, I got by and built confidence over the years. And then as I transitioned to, to major junior hockey, um, you know, being surrounded with phenomenal coaches, uh, and I can go on and on. I think that mentorship played a big piece. Um, I would say our U17, U18 uh, opportunities with Team Ontario, Team Canada were definitive moments for me where I could now, you know, establish myself amongst the best with within, you know, the province and the country and realize that, you know, I'm just another one of them and I can compete at the highest level amongst my age group. And I think those three moments, whether I was nine or uh, 16 and 17 for both the U17 and U18 programs in Team Canada, Team Ontario, I think 
those were moments in my life where, okay, I'm, I'm here. I, I, I can do this. That's awesome. All right. Um, I'm going to, I'm just bouncing around because I, uh, the next question, and then I want you to transition into how you got to Kitchener because that's kind of your next journey. But, uh, growing up, you, you, your neighborhood friends, you're, you're doing all kinds of sports. Did you play other sports, uh, up yeah. along the way? Yeah. Great question. Big, big supporter of children and youth to, to play a variety of sports, right? If, if you don't do it when you're young, you probably will never develop that specific skill and hockey players, you know, need, in my opinion, to develop all of the, um, the different coordination skill set and hockey only provides specifics in, in, in my opinion. Um, so you do need to develop different skills, whether it's and I and lacrosse, um, whether it's uh, soccer and, and develop the, the coordination skills and the footwork in soccer, whether it's the quick reactional skills uh, and I in tennis. Um, those were skills that I believe I developed and enhanced my hockey development abilities through playing soccer, through playing tennis, and became a, a, a durable, hard, grinding forward because of my track and field experience, right? Learning to play, you know, a high pace because you can endure the grind of a five kilometer run because you can endure the race of a 1500 meter race or an 800 meter race or a 400 yeah. meter race, right? All of those skill set. Hockey is an anaerobic sport, but you need an aerobic base and then build a anaerobic base. So I do believe for me, soccer, tennis, track and field, uh, and cross country running were, were, were really beneficial to my development. I wish I'd done more gymnastics and I wish I'd done more martial arts. I did, but in my belief, not, maybe not enough. In, in your time at home, uh, was there any, did you, did you have a spot set up at home to do, you know, shooting, stick handling, messing around, knee hockey, stuff like that? Yeah. Thanks to mom and dad on that front. We, my mom had a flower shop in the home. It, it was, um, picture a two story home and the first story was the garage and, and her flower shop. And we lived above and then there was an extension made to the house and a few times to the side and, and to the backyard. And then in the back, we had uh, a nice swimming pool and, and, and a backyard basketball court that we've turned into a um, an outdoor facility. It wasn't very big, which was a benefit to us developing, you know, and I and uh, perhaps uh, quick feet developed a small area play, the stick handling, the vision, the, the shooting development skills and the biomechanics of that. Dad was very, very good on, on maintaining that, that rank. I remember him, you know, restructuring the... Um, the hole was in having the fire department come over to to uh, amend, amend the plumbing and it was quite uh, interesting because we had a pretty big uh, uh fire hose almost to, to water the the, <laughs> the the outdoor rink and it wasn't it wasn't very big right we're talking 25 feet by 50 feet and we had built boards and you know i still remember cousins of mine who lived next door to the uh, to the west saying you know man uh, you made it, but we certainly had to endure the pounding of those boards with you shooting early in the morning and late and late into the night. So, uh, <laughs> thanks to mom and dad and their supporting and their hard work for for creating that environment for us for sure. So this is funny. Um, you and I have a uh, a commonality, something <laughs> a connection. So you just told me that you lived on a in a, a two story house garage mom's flower shop you guys live above my was it junior year no it was my senior year my senior year at the university of minnesota there was a bar called stub and herbs and that's where we all had our you know team yeah, pre-game meals and that's where all the boosters went and our parents would go after the game well it was attached to a flower shop and Come my senior my senior year I lived above the flower shop. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> oh, oh, bro. Yeah. How, how crazy is that? So, okay. How did That's you get incredible. to, how did you get to Kitchener? Um, cause I, I'm, 
that had to have been, you know, anytime you get drafted to what to one of those major junior teams up there, I mean, that's a heck of, a, of an accomplishment and a, a, a feather in your cap for a bunch of hard work uh, years previous. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I grew up as I mentioned. Winter hockey was was a double A team. We did not have triple A hockey during the season. Uh, I was playing with the Cumberland Barons, and in the, in the spring season, I'd play on a triple A team. We would have two two to four triple A team, depending on the age group in the auto area uh, for the spring season. So most of our tournaments were you know traveling to Montreal or traveling to Toronto to to, to find those competitive tournaments. And, um, uh, still today, the GTHL in Toronto is known to be, you know, the hockey Mecca of, of hockey, not only in Canada, but in my opinion, in, in, in the world outside of, you know, the American big states, such as Minnesota, Michigan, and Massachusetts. But quite frankly, we travel a lot and our summer, summer teams would do quite well in the GTHL in those teams. Um, before getting to Kitchener, I remember my draft year. Uh, and this is a, a funny story today, but maybe not so much at that time. And my, my father was, was good in educating me on the process and um, making sure that I, I made good, educated decisions. And the one time before my major junior, no, sorry, my major bantam year, which was my underage draft year for the Ontario Hockey League, um, training camp was early September for, for that, uh, major Bantam season. So that would have been a double A team. And I asked my dad and I said, dad, uh, can I, can I go out and play war games with, with the boys? Um, you know, and he says, why would you make such foolish decision? Training camp is next week. This is your biggest uh, season of your, 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 your young career so far. Why, why would you do that? Do you think it's a wise decision and whatnot? And through some of his convincing, he led me to believe that the the wiser decision was to not go, and through my stubborn self, uh, I still went. And sure enough, that that war game uh, with the boys led me to, you know, running and escaping the the, the hunted, um, and, and try to free up my, my my teammates on a school property. And you know, uh, persistent surge, climb the rooftop of the school. And as it got, you know, quite intense as I'm being chased by different um, classmates and friends, I jumped the school roof. And this at the point at the time was the gymnasium and it was getting dark and I jumped at the gymnasium and I landed uh, to, to recognize that I was, you know, in, in free air for, for a long time. And sure <laughs> enough, I landed and I broke my ankle and it led to me um, needing surgery and missing the first uh four and a half, almost five months of that season. So September through January, I missed my entire season of my draft year to major junior. Um, Dad wasn't happy. Um, <laughs> no, he wasn't. No. And sure enough, prove, prove them right as well to make sure you make good educated decisions and calculate the risk and whatnot. And, um, you know, to, to make a long story short, I, I came back playing the, the last, I don't know, two weekends of hockey, maybe three, maybe one tournament. Uh, but at this point, I'm just finding my groove again. And sure enough, I, 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 um, I find my way to the under-17 um, regional tryouts. And by that time, I was starting to feel pretty darn good physically. And sure enough, performed and uh, outperformed perhaps some of the other members. And I remember some of the communication, you know, Serge, you're, you're moving on, you're, you're going to district from regional. And from that point, you're going to, um, you know, Ontario final cuts and, and whatnot. And I believe there were three OHL teams at that point that felt pretty strongly about my ability, considering I'd just been injured for most of the season. And one of them was the Kitchener Rangers at the time, managed by Bob Ertl, uh, coached by Jeff Ward. Uh, Jeff Ward, who now coaches in Switzerland, coached a long time with um, Edmonton, coached a long time in Calgary. Uh, one of the best mentors I've had as a coach in, 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 in junior hockey, and I say this to this day, uh, him as a coach as a 16-year-old when I entered the Ontario Hockey League, 
was was one of the best things that happened in my career. Uh, his mentorship, his his commitment to developing young men and young hockey players was was by far something that's uh, struck me in a very impactful way, and I thank him every day for it. In addition to a variety of other guys, but at that particular time in my young hockey career, I know he's very impactful. And, was he impactful uh, because you were? Uh, I mean, did you? get to a point where maybe you thought that, okay, my, my shit don't stink no more. Did he kind of ground you or you, were you pretty level headed and knew that you were, you were chasing and you weren't kind of the leader because of that injury that you had sustained? Yeah. Um, well, I came into Kitchener as an underage. I was the only underage on the team. And, and back then, if you were drafted in the Ontario hockey league as an underage, you were automatically on the team. Um, that said, if a team committed to you to draft you as an underage, you had to be drafted within the first three rounds. And I was drafted in the third round by Kitchener. Uh, their second sentiment behind De- Boyd Devereaux was a first round pick to Edmonton. I think he was fourth overall. Um, and when I came in the Kitchener and met with Jeff and we went over the, you know, the development program, Jeff was, I don't want to say took a, took a, a parent hat on with me, but knowing that I was the youngest player on the team, I think he, he really wanted to make sure that the environment I, w- I was in was a healthy environment and knowing awesome. that I was going to make the team. I just remember him making sure that, you know what, this kid's here to stay. I better make sure that, you know, his environment is safe. His environment is good. His environment is here that he's going to progress. And I think that said, he was also very, very hard on me in a lot of different ways, but he was quite, um, instructive. Uh, he came from a teacher's background. He, he, he was a teacher before becoming a hockey coach and he had that approach, right? Where you've got to teach children, uh, the X's and O's and, and, and let them flourish with their skill set. So ultimately, um, I was a young, uh, French Canadian in an Eng- English environment and, the, the leadership of Bob, the leadership of Jeff, leadership of additional coaches led to me becoming a, a reasonable human being. I, I'd like to believe that I've always been a humble, grounded, down-to-earth individual as well. Uh, so I think a combination of those things certainly helped in, in my stewardship mentorship. What? Uh, so you get to Kitchener, you, you, got, you got someone that you know has your back. Um, even though it's hard on you, um, you start playing and, you know, I, I'm looking at your numbers and I mean, you're, you're pretty, you're pretty solid. You're, you're playing a regular shift and you're almost a point a game. Um, your third year, did you have any runs for the, the big prize? The, is it the Memorial cup? Is that, is that what you go for up there? Yeah. CHL is a Memorial cup, which is a, tournament between uh all three league champions that year and the host so quebec major junior hockey league champion the uh, western hockey league champion the ontario hockey league champion and the host team which rotates between all three teams um every single year um my biggest run in the ontario hockey league was losing in six to the oshawa generals in 1997 uh that's the year the oshawa generals ended up uh, I want to say losing to the Gatti, uh, the whole Olympics uh, at the time. Um, that would have been my furthest playoff run. So a semifinal loss to the OHL champions. Uh, a few other times, I think we lost once to Sarnia in the second round and so on with Owen Sound. Um, one year I actually couldn't perform in the playoffs due to illness, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, and that's what we're going to get to because you know you're you're playing along and progressing as a um, a solid NHL prospect, and I believe it was 1999, and I was watching a video this morning. You score the overtime winner or the game winner in a game that that night, and then the next day, your world completely got flipped where all of a sudden you weren't a hockey player anymore. You were an individual searching for someone that could help save your life. 
yeah, that was a dark time in my life on the, on the, on the preceding uh, items. And you, you asked a question, you know, did, did you go far? And, and before I touch on my illness, um, uh, you know, a semifinal run in Kitchener against the generals and, and just following that was a gold medal with the U18 team Canada championship that led. And the reason I say that it, it, it was certainly enhancing in, you know, the confidence and perhaps the exposure that I received following, uh, but winning a gold medal in 1996 with team Canada's under 18 team. And then following with not being drafted in national hockey league the following year, to me signing a professional hockey contract with the Florida Panthers in October 97 led to another successful junior year. But at that particular time, now we're talking about my 19th year old year in Kitchener, my fourth year and waking up with severe lower back pain and extreme um, body weaknesses. And I was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's an illness that, um, it generally has the immune system attacks, the peripheral part of the nervous system. And in my particular case, uh, I lost feeling in my legs. My motor skills were still there. I could still move one foot in front of the other, but I did not have any sensitivity feelings at all. And as it slowly hit me, uh, the body started to react in a variety of ways, uh, from one clinic visit to a doctor's visit to a hospital visit to being sent back home with the results of you've pulled muscles in your back you've got a severe case of the flu it'll run its course and that ultimately did a little bit more damage to me and through being persistent and going back to the hospital and, and asking for for some 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 help and further testing i was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre 10 days later that's um Something that was difficult, right? I was sidelined for a year away from the game. I spent two months in a hospital. I spent a month in a rehab hospital. Um, you know, a lot of dark moments where as a young man, you're 19 years old, you're at the peak point of your career, you sign a professional contract with an NHL team and all of a sudden you're on a hospital bed, you're turning 20 years old and you're 140 pounds, you can no longer walk on your own, you can no longer eat and process food, you're trying to get up and you're fainting, you're just going through so many different life challenges that I wouldn't wish on anybody, quite frankly, but quite frankly, without feeling any any sense of uh, sorry for myself. I think ultimately things happen for a reason. And this, uh, this life experience to me was there for a reason. And the good Lord upstairs had its reasons. And to this day, I, I'm thankful for that life experience because it's made me who I am today. Somebody that's grateful for the simple things in life, right? Our health, our relationships and how we can influence the next generation, impact lives and serve. So quite frankly, a uh, difficult time in my life, but it's made me who I am today. And I may not have played hockey uh, at a pro level a year earlier. Uh, I may not have played as long as I wished I've played for. Uh, ultimately, maybe because of that. Uh, but ultimately, I couldn't be more thankful for that life experience because it's made me who I am today. And things certainly happen for a reason. You are so well-spoken. Uh, I, I feel very inferior talking to you, <laughs> but, uh, uh, very well said. And, um, you know, I, I just, I think back and it might've been the, it was, it was, it was the year that we played together. So every NHL training camp, you have to go through a physical before you get cleared to be able to, to participate in, in camp. And I, I think I had eight or eight surgeries up until that point, and I had one on my knee, and my knee was bothering me, and I, you know, all summer. So they asked you, and I said, I don't know, my knee's kind of bothering me. Uh, it's not debilitating, but it feels like, you know, before I got it scoped, whatever. So we had a MRI, and long story short, uh, we're practicing, and all of a sudden I get called off by, by our trainer and says, you got to go see the doctor. So rut row. That's not good. So I go there and he basically tells me that they believe I have a tumor growing behind my kneecap on my on the tip of my femur. Whoa. So and how this is going back to you is that 
it, I, I started a battery of tests. You know, I, I went through a bunch of tests and it took at least two to three weeks to find out the results, which it wasn't cancer. But I'm thinking about what you went through, uh, a, a young kid who's invested everything to, to be a hockey player, uh, bright future, optimistic, confident. And all of a sudden you have 10 days where you don't know what the heck is going to be next in your life. How did you get through that? Because you talked about God and um, we rely on him for a lot, but, but were you faith-based? Uh, you know, was it, what is, was it as strong prior to you uh, getting sick uh, or did that change during that process? Yeah, great question. I, I grew up Catholic. We didn't necessarily go to church, though. So. Uh, you know, I was one to believe that you lead a good life, you get to heaven. Uh, and ultimately that's maybe the case, but ultimately I, I do believe in a relationship with Christ, uh, being the most important and giving your life to Christ. I, I am faith based. I was not as strong. No, definitely not back then. I remember attending, uh, Bible study chapels within our Kitchener Ranger organization and, and one individual, that kept preaching to us and helping us understand who Christ was, uh, is Dean Prentice, who was a former NHL player, played for a very long time, 24 years, recently passed away. Him and his wife, June, would come and, and, and run our, our, our chapels on a, on a monthly uh, basis the first few years, and then that grew into a weekly basis. And our team trainer, Dan Liebold, who was also faith-based and extremely supportive during my time at Kitchener, still the head athletic director, um, uh, trainer for the, the Rangers to date. Um, in my relationship with Christ grew then in, in trying to understand what it is to have a relationship with Christ um, on, on that faith base. It still wasn't a deep relationship until I, I, I moved to, to Florida and attended uh, Calvary Chapel and, and gave my life to Christ at a, a local uh, community church here, the Calvary Chapel with Pastor Bob Coy at the time. I was invited by Jan Pekka, our strength, um, uh, strength yeah, director. Yeah, yes. Yeah. We're stretching. We're doing some PNF stretching on the ground. And it was after a morning skate, uh, I should say morning practice, and Jan just you know, casually brought up, hey, going to church today, what are you up to, right? I'm a single guy living in South Florida, playing the National Hockey League. It was something that was pretty, pretty cool and mem memorable for me to this day. Awesome. Um, thank you for sharing that. And, and, um, and, and you know, it's even deeper than that. And I'll, and I'll just add and share. I bring up Yawn, PNF stretching on the ground in the Panther locker room. This is going back to 2000, right? The year, my first year in Florida with you, Lance. And sure enough, sure enough, fast track a couple of years later, because I was eventually traded to Ottawa, spent some time in Ottawa in, in the American League. And then I came back uh, to Florida at the time, was going through a lot of different uh, things in his own life. And sure enough, in that same location in the Panther locker room, I asked Steve to join me at church and he immediately accepted. It was after a skate. He came to church. We're sitting in the same place in church. And sure enough, when pastor Bob said the sinner's prayer, Steve nudged me on the elbow, ran to the front. I ran with him. And, and sure enough, for those who don't know Steve Montador, he was a great individual, great human being, played a long time in the National Hockey League for a variety of organizations, blessed to have been a teammate of his. And, um, you know, he passed away a few years later, uh, knowing that he gave his life to Christ was, 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 was pretty cool and being a part of that whole experience for him. And But how it all evolved from Jan asking me from the Panther locker room and then years later, uh, you know, four or five years later, asking Steve to do the same, I was able to, to pay it forward on that front. But it was obviously God's movement there. Fantastic. Okay, I want to go. You are playing for Kitchener, and all of a sudden, how did it? Were you in Florida? Were you playing junior, and then you got called up by Florida? Uh, talk about 
the moment you found out you were playing in your first NHL game and then till you got there. Yeah, so play on Team Canada's under-18 team, draft year, not drafted, play another year. But I ended up going to. I had a few a few options for for camp. I chose to go to Florida with the opportunity and one of their scouts believing in me. I come to Florida with a resilient mindset and do what I can to impress. After training camp, I get a contract. That's October 1997. I'm a junior player at the time, so I come back to junior hockey. I have a good junior career. Uh, I get Guillain-Barré syndrome in '99. I'm out for a year. I come back as an overage. Uh, in other words, as a 20-year-old in Kitchener to play, you know, half the season, the tail end of it. And the following year, I start in Florida, uh, back to training camp. I don't make the team. I'm one of the last cuts. That's the year you and I played together. I started the first 11 games in Louisville with the Louisville Panthers, which was Florida's Amer- uh, American Hockey League team. Panthers were were having some difficult uh, times with, with injuries. I get the call up. I'm in I'm in my locker on the road in uh, Syracuse, New York, and we're playing a three and three, and this is a Friday night or maybe a Saturday night. And sure enough, one of our team trainers before the game, Spilsey, I don't know if you remember him or not, but he comes over and he says, um, "Serge, make sure you have a great game today." And I kind of looked at him funny, thinking, well, "What's he? What's he referring to? Why is he saying that?" He says, "No, make sure you have a really good game today." Okay, I didn't think anything of it at all. And I go on and obviously we, we, we play the game and the game ends. We I want to say we won 4-3 and I had two goals and an assist. And as a young man, that was a pretty good night. And sure enough, you know, we're, we're undressing. I, I jump in the showers. I had family in town. We're in Syracuse, New York, which is only three and a half hours south of Ottawa. And uh, Joe Patterson, our head coach, comes in the shower, basically just steps in and there's a variety of other guys. I still remember the guys kind of just with shampoo in their hair and Joseph Serge. And he looks me right in the face and he says, come here, son. Come here. I got to shake your hand. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what's going on, right? Yeah. He says, I want to I I congratulate you on your first NHL call up. You're going to the National Hockey League. You're being called up. Your flight's tomorrow morning. Wow. And I just remember the overwhelming moment to this day. I remember the guys that were around me in the shower. I remember his expression. I remember the moment like it was yesterday. It was extremely impactful. It was a, a charitable, charitable moment. And I'll remember it to this day, right? And and as I'm involved with the youth today and, and mentorship and, and our sports agency, I just look back and I think every single moment you can impact a life, how memorable that can be for that young life. And that moment Joe created for me is still to this day, you know, stamped in my mind. Um, sure enough, I get the call up. First NHL game was against the Atlanta Trashers, uh, <laughs> November 13th. Um, had a fight against Denny Lambert. I thought I did all right. Stepping up for, for teammate Rob Niedermeyer, who was kind of checked from the, from the back. And uh, I remember playing with you, Lance, and to this day, one of the best teammates I've ever had. So honestly, those those memories are, are just absolutely uh, cherishable forever. So you just mentioned, uh, well, congratulations on that. That's an unbelievable story, and um, <laughs> that had to have been uncomfortable. A lot of, uh, not many conversations like that happen in the shower. <laughs> 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 it was a unique one, but you know what? That that's what makes it special, right? It is unique, and um, you know, we'll remember it for the rest of my life. So, you uh, another thing that I I found that you had a, another special moment during your career uh, when you scored your first NHL goal. Um, it happened against the Ottawa Senators, correct? That is correct. And uh, you're. 30 kilometers from there. So I'm sure that there was a ton of family and friends there. Talk about that, how cool it was, because I can remember mine. It was in uh, Madison Square Garden against Mike Richter. Yeah, it's it's special, right? These are moments you work so hard for such a long time and so many different uh, individuals, family members, friends, and 
have, have impacted your life to put you in such position or at least expose you and give you opportunities. And um, it's my fourth NHL game. I've been called up now for about 10 days. And, you know, the Panthers, we as a, as a team are, are winning one, losing one type thing. And we're playing in Ottawa. And Ottawa at this at this time in 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 their um, in their franchise, you know, they're they're a good team. And sure enough, it's late in the period. Um, I'm not on the ice. Um, Terry Murray nudges me. There's an offensive faceoff uh, to go on the ice, and it was with Len Barry taking the draw, and I want to say Big Pete Orell <laughs> on, on 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 the right wing, and um, I happen to line up. We win the draw. Lenny wins the draw. It goes to our point. Point shot. I get a rebound position in the slot with my stick on the ice, right? Talking about good habits. Um, sure enough, I must have listened to someone along the way and tapped it in, right? And <laughs> even that moment, right? You, you remember uh, picture moments of, of the event. And what's really funny about that story, Lance, is um, my father, who was in the building, ended up being in the bathroom while I scored. And the reason he was in the bathroom is he realized that, you know, there was only, um, you know, less than 15 seconds left in the period. And he recognized that I was on the bench and it's an offensive draw. So he wanted to beat the line to the bathroom between the missions. <laughs> so he rushed to the bathroom uh, while Terry Murray, our head coach, nudged me on the back and we went on the ice. And while, while he's doing his thing in the bathroom, the face off a cure and sure enough, he missed my first goal, which is quite funny to this day. It's a family story. And uh, I think if there's a memory there or advice to parents, make sure you don't miss a minute of your child's uh, home game, right? <laughs> I got a smile on my face just listening to that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Oh, awesome. Okay, so this is a question because um, it is it is so hard to just get – that NHL, that first NHL opportunity, and then to accumulate a bunch of games, uh, but then to to be an everyday player. Um, why don't you, because, I mean, you, what did you have, a 12, 10, 12-year 12 career? What was it? Yeah, I played 12 years. Um, 12. You yeah. know, ultimately, um, so no, hold years. on, hold on. Let me finish this. So 12 years. So – why do you think that you couldn't become an everyday everyday NHL player for two consecutive years? Because I couldn't. I mean, I was my my first NHL game was twenty seven years old. I didn't, you know, I didn't even think I had a chance. Um, but then somehow, uh, after a couple of years going up and down, I stuck for a few years. You know, um, you put up some good numbers. What happened? Yeah, very good question, Lance. <laughs> You know, I think for families and, and, and children, those listening, uh, there, there's so many different variables that come into play, and, and everybody would agree to that. Um, the the higher level you play, you know, the thinner the funnel, right? Um, yeah. Competition, opportunity, timing, you know, having a coach who truly believes in you and wants to give you that opportunity at the right time. There's so many different factors outside of the competition itself. There's not enough jobs for the amount of skill and the amount of uh, demand, um, you know, players that are available. There's so much parity. Uh, I would say I would say this in, in two ways. I would say you get an opportunity because somebody believes in you and you're playing and you're in the right place at the right time, right? You're 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 booming. You're healthy. You're performing at that particular time. There's a lot of hockey players that never get a shot that should get a shot, but there just right. wasn't an opportunity. Right. I was fortunate enough to be hot at the time where the team needed my services, and I took advantage of that time when I did get the opportunity. Right. And and to credit to all of those who, who do take advantage of their opportunity, when the opportunity is there, you got to take advantage of it. Because if you don't, then you're sent back, and who knows if you ever get called up again. You know, I say I fought in my first game. Not that every player needs to fight, but you certainly need to have an impact. You want your name to be circulated at the end of the game between the coaches and management, right? What did you do to impact the team? Do you make this team a better team when you're in the lineup? 
Are you the guy that selfishly pouts if things don't go your way? If you're given a specific role, do you take advantage of that role? Do you embrace it and become, you know, that role player that that need, that team needs? I took a lot of pride in my, you know, defensive ability and defensive awareness. And I knew that with my abilities as a skater, as a mobile player, then I needed a good stick on puck. I needed to defend. I needed to be an asset and reliable asset for the team when I was dependent on. And I think coaches saw that, right? And and nowadays, as I personally coach children, you know, you, you tend to want to credit the young man or the young woman that not only is deserving, but that is consistently reliable, right? You want to give those individuals candy when you need to give out a candy, um, so I took a lot of pride in that uh, and not be so focused on, you know, oh, I need to score. I need to be on the scoreboard. I need to, I need to make sure that I, I impact the game in a very good way. And I impact my team in a way that I'm contributing to the team being a better team because I'm in the lineup. And you did that all the time, all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I mean, you, you had, an NHL career, um, you ended up playing in a lot of different places, having some unbelievable experiences. And just to steal a phrase that you've already said here, you wouldn't change anything because all of those experiences have shaped you to the person you are today. Uh, I feel the exact same way about everything that I had to go through as a hockey player. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, you ended up playing over in Europe. I want I you think, to talk. I, little... I think let me let me add one thing to that, Lance. I Absolutely. Think, I think I think that point, and, and I'm not one to live in the past. But you also want to learn and, and be truthful to yourself, right? Would you do anything different? And I certainly wouldn't, because it's put me in a position in life where I am where I am today, and and I love every minute of it. I am one to really embrace life and love life in every moment. And through a resilient mindset and a relentless willingness to work, help me persevere through the adversity. And, and I think that is, is what helped me get over the line, right? I was willing to do whatever it takes and I wouldn't take no for an answer. And sometimes you've got to admit it to yourself that even though the obstacles are big, make sure that you do whatever you can over and over and over again to persevere and no for an answer is not acceptable. I say that because then, you know, the experience with Guillaume Boré and wanting to give back and now through the Search Bay Foundation, we, we do a lot. But if there's one little piece that I wish I'd managed maybe a little bit different that may have helped prolong my career is, is my my time with a surge pay foundation at such an early age, right? I, I had Guillain Barre syndrome in 1999. We started a campaign and I'm doing a lot of different charity events. And that took up a lot of my time. And for me, being in the top physical shape was so important. that I think my commitment to the foundation, which is great. It's, 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 it's mine. I founded it. I'm so proud of it. I wouldn't change it. But I also want to tell the young listeners out there to make sure that they limit the distractions in the present because a hockey career can be so short and the window may be open for a short period of time. Have a vision to do what you do for to give back because there's nothing I'd change on that front. But if I'd learned, I may have managed it a little bit different because I managed so much on the Search Bay Foundation at an early age where I needed to make sure that maybe from a, dis not distraction, but from a commitment to the priority was training and making sure that I did my workouts twice a day versus maybe just once a day. But since I had a, a commitment that was maybe a little bit more challenging in the off season, wouldn't, wouldn't change it because it's put me where I'm at today. But I also want to be mindful for the current generation. Take time to give back but manage your time wisely to make sure it doesn't affect anything you need to do to put yourself in that position to even give more back later in life. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that um, interjection. Uh, and the other thing that I would add is that, you know, there's been a lot of talk of adversity and challenges during this podcast. And 
the one thing I want everyone that's listening to know is that you're not unique, Serge. This happens to everyone. Every podcast that I've done with a former player has had adversity. I just interviewed a gal named Winnie Brote, cut from the U.S. Olympic team three times, <laughs> you know. But the the lessons that are available to learn are there. But I just want people to to know that again. You 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 feel like you're on an island where that this isn't happening to anyone else but it happens to all of us. It's just wrapped in a different paper, you know, different colored paper. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Right. Everybody has a story. Uh, some are, are life threatening, some are not, but every story is fascinating when you start looking into them and you know, we're, we're here on earth for such a short time. And it's, it's great that you're doing this podcast Lance, because these stories are come and go and they're forgotten unless, you know, we, we create, a memory of it right so this this is fantastic well thank you i uh i love it um i make zero pennies on it <laughs> but, uh like seriously i just uh, they i read a lot i listen a lot um i'm a lifelong learner and you know everyone says that you know find something that you love to do and eventually you know it'll be really hard for you to distinguish between it being uh, work or play. And this is play for me because I get to connect with some people that I haven't talked with in a long, long time uh, and hear their journey and get inspired and inspire other players that are on the same path, wanting what you achieved. Uh, so it's pretty cool. So thank you. Yeah, no, you're you, well, one. You're, you're you're so welcome. Uh, two, you're great at it, and ultimately, you're you're inspiring a lot of a lot of the youth and even the, the current adult to to listen to these stories and uh, impact their lives in a variety of ways. So, thank you. All right, awesome. Um, okay, every player at some point or another has to deal with one thing: Can I do it one more year? Uh, how did it end for you as a player? Because I know you ended up, uh, over in Europe. Uh, when did you know it was over? Let's talk about the Europe time and, uh, what that experience was like, because, uh, I've heard that it's, it's awesome, not so great. And then, uh, did you end on your terms? That is a loaded question, Lance. I, that's all I do. I, I got the six shooter loaded and I just start firing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a loaded question. Did I end on my terms? Um, yes, ultimately, I, I made the, the conscious decision to um, to not continue to play. Uh, but was it your body yeah. telling you? Because for me, yeah. it was I I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, it was my okay. it was my body, uh, not physical body. I don't think at that particular time. I would say this. Um, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, at the time I, I was engaged to a lovely lady and, um, you know, this is going to get personal, but quite frankly, the, the relationship went south for, for different reasons. And I was playing in Europe at the time, and this is entering, uh, my second year in Europe after a very, very good first year in Europe. And, uh, you know, relationships are, are great for all of the right reasons, but quite frankly, for me, mentally, it was extremely, extremely difficult to face the challenges of, you know, moving overseas again for an entire other season after just going through what I was going through personally, you know, you, yeah. you, you go through, through life and relationships and, you know, a lot of these things can be uh, are heartbroken when you're talking about committing, potentially committing your life to someone. And mentally I was just a mess for a whole year. And that year, unfortunately, after a very good year, um, you know, we're talking, you know, even in, in the, in the playoffs of my first year in Germany in the DEL, which is the top German league, you know, getting playoff MVP for our team and our team losing in seven to, to Dusseldorf and, that summer just being a mess and not being able to mentally, um, you know, dial, dial in. And when I went back to Europe, that following year was not a good year for me. Um, 
I, I, I was not engaged mentally. I was a mess and not to, to blame that, but ultimately I also need to be honest with it and honest with myself. It led to me not having a good year. And as a result, when you don't have a good year and it's a contract year, you know, you're led with options that are, okay, do I want to continue doing this? You know, bite the bullet, play for, call it less money, less of a lucrative contract another year and, and build the profile again. Or, you know, do I just take some time away and, and see what's there come, you know, uh, October, November as a free agent? And, and that's what I did and took time for myself and ultimately led to me signing, you know, a half, half year contract uh, in Norway, which is with a great life experience. Uh, but at that time, I think mentally I was in a position where, you know what, I think it's time for me to um, do something else and move on to the next chapter in my life, which ultimately so grateful for the things that have happened in my life because it's led me to make good concrete decisions. And now I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be where I'm at in my professional life. Unbelievable story of perseverance and just digging, you know, putting your stakes in the ground and saying, all right, if you want to come stop me, come try. <laughs> Cause I, I'm not going nowhere. So Congratulations on an unbelievable career. How did you transition now into what you're doing today? Uh, did it just happen right away, or were there a few steps along the way before you got into the, the the business that you're in now? Yeah, so we have two companies. We have a sports management company, Unlimited Sports Management, uh, focused on advising, mentoring young hockey players, contract negotiations in the whole player representation um so a family the, advisor agent correct and we do they okay real quick do you represent any girls great question it's funny you say that because we may be launching a, a, a woman's division with women's hockey uh, it's, uh yeah you know, at, at, at this at this very moment i would say we've helped out a couple girls through the relationships that we've had internationally uh, at, at, the, at this time, our agency, uh, I would say, um, is exploring the potential of, of, of launching that division. But right now, we're, we're not there at this moment. But okay, you've got, got to love to see women's hockey and how it's evolving and how it's given opportunities to, to not only male, but female players as well. The second business is um, real estate, right? I, I got my first signing bonus in 1997. It was a big $30,000 check. One that came in, in the sum of <laughs> that fifteen. One. one that came in the sum of fifteen thousand on December thirty first, nineteen ninety seven, and one that came January first, um, nineteen ninety eight. And I and I took those two signing bonuses, and uh, funny enough, with an NHL contract and, and and a reasonable base salary uh, at the time, my career NHL salary was two hundred seventy five thousand plus bonuses. Uh, but it permitted me to, you know, to buy residential properties, and, and I did that. And I developed a passion for for residential properties and grew a portfolio of, of assets that way. And um, today, you know, we we service, um, you know, the the brokering brokerage side of things. We help individuals find a home through our real estate team. We renovate homes. We've done some new construction. My wife and I are building a home now here locally in South Florida next to the War Memorial, which is the new Panther practice facility here in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, downtown. Um, between those two businesses, I'm, I'm, I'm quite busy. Um, but I got to tell you, I live my life every day loving building relationships, right? At the end of the day, sports management has helped me do that. Real estate has helped me do that. I coach both of our children uh, in minor hockey with the Junior Panthers U8 and U10 programs. And I just love the opportunity to impact lives, serve them, and build those relationships. Um, we've got the, the Surge Pay Foundations that's doing a lot of in, impactful work in the communities right now. So before those four major human being responsibilities, I, I've got a pretty busy life. Uh, not much time for social life, but I'm okay with that. We sound very similar. <laughs> I used to have a social life, but uh, <laughs> now I got a bunch of different balls in the air that I didn't know about, you know, years ago, and I'm happy with it, and I'm okay with it. Um, let me marry Doris, I believe, and is it Leander and Levin? 
Yeah, so my wife, Doris. Um, yeah, hold on. Do you coach? Do they play hockey? Yeah, Leander just turned nine. He's playing on the uh, Junior Panthers U10 team, and Levin is six. He plays on the Panthers Junior A team. I do coach both teams, yes. So you're in the trenches. I had a 17-year coaching career. Third year not coaching, love it. Glad I had the experience, but <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to do it anymore. It's it, it's it's real life, right? It really is. Oh, it's awesome. It, it, it honestly, it's probably. I think think the whole coaching hat on, uh, mentorship hat on, the father hat on, the husband hat on. You know, when you when you combine all of those together, and you put yourself in a position where you can. You can coach the youth, young men and women, and give them insights on life and guidance and, 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 and help them along their way to make good, educated decisions and truly impact their lives and see their growth, right? You look at so many different life challenges and, and, and the distractions that's out there impacting their lives at school or whether, whether all of their different extracurriculum activities. We've built an environment within those teams that is very, very positive. It's all about establishing a culture. It's all about impacting their lives. It's all about making sure that at the end of the season, their lives is a better life now. And they're in an environment where they're safe, they're happy, they're building friends, they're working hard toward a common goal, and they're persevering through a lot of different adversity. And all of that is being done with a team, right? So. I'm really, really enjoying it to the point where hockey season's coming to, to an end here. We've got a few more um, events and practices, but I got to tell you, I got a, I got a bitter, bitter piece of it because after every hockey season comes, you know, okay, next year is a different team. Certainly try to keep, you know, uh, the evolution of, of, of the children and making sure that you're still involved in their life. But, because of the age groups and, and those types of restrictions, you know, you, you'll you'll probably likely, maybe, but probably not have the very same, you know, 17 boys and girls or on the U10 and or on the U13, 13 kids in the same locker room ever again, right? So yep. when you look at it that way, uh, you certainly cherish the moments, the memories and the relationships. It's, it's, it's one of the best times of my life by far. Well... well all I can say is that if I was a baseball player and someone was, let's say, a beat writer for the Florida Panthers, listen to it, he would say that I knocked this episode out of the park. You were amazing. <laughs> um, Mr. Paye, first, let me thank you for taking the time and sharing your hockey journey with me and the listeners. Second, congratulations on a great hockey career. And finally, thank you for continuing to try to improve the game of hockey, but most importantly, helping others trying to reach a higher level in the sport, supporting them in every aspect of life to give each individual the best opportunity to succeed. Uh, if there's anything I can do to assist you in what you have going on, please don't hesitate to ask. Send me your... Um, couple websites we got the Serge Pie Foundation and then I can't remember what your your uh, uh, agency business is but send me those I'll put those in the description description but thank you Serge for sharing your hockey journey Lance I appreciate you and what a joy it was to spend an hour here together anytime love to, to to speak to you I look forward to some time together maybe a cold beverage over the next few years if you're down here or if I'm up there um, and, and what an honor, Lance, to have had the opportunity to, to share life with you as a teammate to your audience. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, your listeners, what a joy, privilege, honor um, to have shared life with you as a teammate of yours um, during our time here in South Florida. Thank you for everything you're doing for your listeners, for the youth, for individuals that listen to you uh, on a weekly basis. So thank you, Lance, for everything. I love you very much, and I look forward to, to getting caught up with life here in the, in the near future. I love you too, brother, and an adult beverage sounds awesome. <laughs> sounds great. Thanks, Lance. Appreciate your time. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. 
I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing the hockey journey of Serge Paye and what a journey it was. If any of you young hockey hopefuls are looking for a mentor and someone you can learn from, Serge is someone I would highly recommend. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.